Cherry Brown, welcome back to the Bookaholic podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here here again. Yes, yes, yes. You are my first repeat guest. So I guess that deserves some applause because (laughs) because you're a really good writer and uh, you really stay on top of that writing game. And and you you have a new book to reveal to us today. But before we get into that, let's let's refresh the audience about who Terry Brown is. Now, one of the things I wanted to refresh the audience about is how you actually got into writing. Tell us about that journey. So I I started writing with small businesses in 2000. I did like a lot of content type work. Um, and I did that for years, uh, years. I started it in 2000. I'm still do. I still have a couple of clients that I'm working with that way. And it was not a scary way to start writing because I didn't feel like myself was invested in it. Um, I was right. writing and I was learning good sentence structure and things along that line, but I never felt like my writing reflected anything about me. It reflected about my clients and what they needed and what they needed for their clients. And mm-hmm. so if someone didn't care for what I had written, it was usually more of an indication of they weren't the right person to be reading it, you know, that that wasn't who my client was looking for. And so it was really not scary. On the other hand, writing a novel is scary because that's, those are your characters. They're your babies. Those are the things that came from inside of you. And Mm -hmm. so, so Mm -hmm. putting that out into the world, you have to have a really safe place to land in case someone doesn't like it. And At the time, I was living in an abusive relationship, an emotionally Mm -hmm. abusive relationship, and I I didn't have a safe spot to land. And I I, I couldn't write. There was was too much fear to even consider putting myself out there. But I got out Mm -hmm. of that relationship in 2017, and Mm -hmm. immediately all those voices in my head that have been there for years insisted that I start writing. And so I did. And I wrote um, a couple of manuscripts. Neither one will see the light of day because it'd be like an artist showing their very first painting, you know, when you're still learning the brush strokes. And and so they're, they're really not good, but they taught me so much about who I am and what I needed to work on and where my strengths were and where they weren't. And, you know, how was I going to strengthen those parts and, what was a genre that I felt most comfortable working in at least to start and all of those things. Um, And then I finally wrote my first manuscript that got published, which was sunflowers beneath the snow. And that went out last January, which you and I talked about. Yes. Yes. Right. And so now I've got my second one out. Got you. Got you. Yes. And, and, you know, the sun, sunflowers beneath the snow is the a story of the Ukraine, it which is. at the time, that was about eight months ago, you and I spoke. Uh, it was episode 30. This is going to be close to episode 60. Wow, so yeah. half a podcast ago, I spoke <laughs> to you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we I remember us talking about how applicable your story was because, you know, the, the war in Ukraine. And we're still, you know, there's still we're the war in Ukraine and it's still a devastating and heartbreaking event. Tell us a little a bit about uh, this, this story. So the Sunflowers Beneath the Snow follows three generations of Ukrainian women. It starts um, in Soviet Ukraine in the 70s, and it goes through to almost the present at the point where um, Russia invaded Ukraine the first time in 2014. Um, and it just, it follows these three women and their story and, and what happened to them when um, the, the grandmother whose whose husband became a rebel and his decision to do that and how it affected them through all of these years. And you just see their growth. But at the same time, you see the growth of Ukraine as it went from being Mm. a nation that was, um, you know, a communist nation to that early independence to a later independence where they finally were really getting things together and and starting to understand what independence means and, and how to do that and then to be invaded again. And then the book came came out four weeks or three and a half weeks before the current invasion. 
So the, uh. the timeliness was just uncanny. And, uh. and it was, it's, you know, it's, there's never a good time. I mean, to say that that's a good time for this book to come out. I mean, it's, it's almost, I hate saying that, but right, right. in, in other words, it really is a good time because it helps people really understand some of this background of, of what is going on there because here in the United States, it's so it's far away, you know, it's, you think about it and it's a shame and it's over there and right. it doesn't really touch us on a day-to-day -day basis. And we don't really have an understanding of how long has this been going on. Right. And right you'll find if you read the book that it's been going on for generations. This isn't okay. something that started in 2014 or started in 2022. This started, mm -hmm. you know, generations and generations ago. And there mm -hmm. is a strong dislike between the two nations. But unfortunately, because of where they're situated and how the borders have shifted, uh. there are people of both countries who are living in both countries. You see, right, so, right, right. so like you might have been born in Ukraine and ended up in Russia and then you're back in Ukraine and, and, and it changes back and forth. And yeah. so there's especially along the border and then along in the in the um, where they have the port. There's been a lot of back and forth because those are the areas that are most in dispute. Right. And, and you right. know, and that's what we're seeing today. If you look at where a lot of the, the fighting is, it's to get that port and it's to get a land bridge right. to that port and, you know, all right. of those things. And so this book helps explain that in a way that's friendly so that you don't yes. feel like you're reading an encyclopedia article, you know. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, um, that's so true. And <sighs> Just the few words that you said that have been uh, enemies, you know, his, for generations, you know, like you said, I didn't realize that really, right. because through all of the reporting, I didn't get that. And I also didn't get that the borders had been shifting. I knew they wanted the port. Right. But I didn't realize that it had been shifting. And if you were there and you lived on those borders, you might be in Ukraine one one decade and in Russia, the next. I didn't realize that. Well, and the other thing is, is because the borders have been in dispute, there are, I'm going to call them Russian Ukrainians or Ukrainian Russians, where they've got a, a multitude of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So, so they could have, they could have family literally on both sides, both Russian and Ukrainian. Who are they? Right. You know, and they're in that disputed area and, and Russia says they're ours. And wow. Ukraine says they're ours. And wow. there is where you get the, the problem that happens there. So I, I got that 100%. Yeah. Now, with um, with Sunflowers Beneath the Snow and your new book, An Enemy Like Me, it seems like you are enjoying or like to write historical fiction. Tell us, um, tell us that that's, that's going to be your genre. That's going to be your thing. Historical fiction. I think that's going to be my thing for now. Okay. Um, I, my third, I have a third manuscript that I'm writing. It's also historical fiction, but I oh. do have a romantic comedy idea in my head that I really want to okay. work on. And I have, I, I have a young adult fiction idea. I don't know that it'll ever go anywhere, but I have that in my head. So I tell people that what I really write is character driven fiction. Mm -hmm. And right now my settings happen to be historical. But gotcha. if you enjoy a character that grows, that starts in one place and, and you watch them grow and you get inside their heads and you know their thoughts and mm -hmm. you kind of become that character when you're reading if that's right. the kind of book you like then I'm the kind of author that you would want to read because yes it's historical fiction but the mm -hmm. setting is kind of incidental I need uh -huh. a setting I need the I need the character to be somewhere right and I need the right. character to be in some time period and right. what I love about historical fiction, I'm not as good at setting as I am at character development. And okay. so like, I would be a horrible science fiction writer, you know, where okay. they develop the worlds and yes. it just isn't, it isn't my strength, but in yeah. historical fiction, the setting is there. The so setting all I have, right. All I have to That's do is, is research it well enough 
that, right. that when I describe it to my reader, they know where they are and they feel it and there they are. And that is, yes. that is more me. That is, that's what I need. And I think that I can probably write um, like a modern, you know, contemporary, because I live in a contemporary world. I would right. be able to do a contemporary U.S. kind of novel because mm -hmm. I can write about what I, I know. Right. I would have a hard, like, honestly, I would be a terrible science fiction writer. And I'm well, not sure that my young adult fiction can happen because young adult fiction likes that world building. And I'm mm. just not strong at that. So we'll have to see where that goes. <laughs> wow. Well, you know what? I believe that is the first time I've ever heard what you just said uh, on my podcast. And, um, build, you know, we I have talked to authors about character development and building those worlds. But you just said it to where when you write historical fiction, you don't have to build the world. The, that world there. once existed and all you have to, well, I'm not saying all you have to do, but you have to research it and that right. world will unveil itself. It's, it's just exactly. already there. Exactly. Oh and so, God. yeah. So for me, it's, it's a perfect fit for, you know, when I said to you that my first manuscripts, you know, I found, found out where my strengths were and where my weaknesses were. Well, my strengths are very much character building. I'm, I am really good at dialogue and I'm really good at getting people to feel the emotions and to understand what's going mm -hmm. on in, in emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that I'm not very good at telling you what my character looks like. And I'm very bad at describing where they are. So the first two manuscripts were modern day contemporary. And it was like, oh my gosh, they literally could be anywhere at any time. We have no yeah. idea. We have no yeah. idea because I've not said anything to help my reader know where we are. And so right. I thought, well, what am I going to do about that? And then historical fiction came to mind. I love research. So mm. I have two real passions. I love research and I love writing. And to be able to kind of combine those two. And then I do historical research and I find out all these cool facts that I can then use to create this scene for my readers. And I'm kind of like educating you at the same time because now you're learning things that you didn't know because right. of the research that I did. So, yeah, I call myself a research junkie. Oh, <laughs> well, that's great if you're writing historical fiction. Yeah, that's right up the is. alley there. Well, yeah. you know, I, I, when you look at your website, which is terrymbrown.com, you know, it has that historical fiction flair. You have the old uh, fashioned typewriter yeah. and old fashioned books there. Um, and, you know, it, it just uh, harkens to, to kind of revealing who you are. And I love the phrase you have on there, connecting readers with characters they'd love to invite to lunch. Now, I think you hinted, you didn't say those words a little earlier, but you did hint um, to that type of vibe for the characters. So tell us about, say, Sunflower Beneath the Snow. Why would you like to have lunch with some of those characters? Would it be all of the characters or some of the characters? Tell us about that. So I always ask that when I've been to a lot of book clubs where they've invited me to come and talk to the, to the women after they've read the book. And I always ask like, who was your favorite character? Mm -hmm. And some people can't tell me, Oh, I loved them all. And some people have a definite favorite, you know, mm -hmm. like, Oh, mm -hmm. I would want to go to lunch with Yvette because she and I, and we have the same ideas about life or mm. um, I would want to, I would want to go to lunch with Ivana because she's so different than I am. Like she mm -hmm. had this, this idea about communism and, and I don't understand that. And I would love to go to lunch with her to try to like pick her brain and find out what makes you tick. Like, why would you mm -hmm. want to be who you are? And others, mm -hmm. you know, want to go to lunch with um, Iona, the youngest, because she is, um, adventurous and, and has like this go get them spirit. In fact, I always tell people Iona is the young person that I wish that I had been. Ah. You know, she's she's got guts. 
You know, she mm. just went out there and just did things. I mean, she went she went yeah. from the Ukraine to the United States. And then when she w- was trapped there because of a war, she she just adapted and became. And I think to myself, what would I do if I were in a foreign country all alone at, you know, 20 years old? What would right. I do? I, I would right. panic. I would be a mess. You know, yeah. and here she here yeah. she went off to New York City and, and just became. And so, right. yeah, she's kind of the person that that it's like if I could do life over, if I could go back and talk to my young self, uh-huh. I would be more like her. You know, wow. like I would make myself be more like her. Um, yes. So I think that's why I say that about the characters is, is I hope that I've developed a character that you say when you're done reading, man, I'd like to be that person's friend. Right, right, so. right, right. Oh, wow. Yeah, that that's 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 a very good telling right there. Now, so let's dive into your new book, uh, An Enemy Like Me, Historical Fiction, World right. War II. World War II. Mm-hmm. Definitely a lot of information out there about World War II. Right, right. Yes. And so I had a lot of people say, now, are you sure you want to write another World War II? Because, yeah. you know, World War II, there's a lot of World War II. But this yes. book really goes at a very different angle than a lot of them. So the uh, main character is a first generation German American. So okay. his family was from Germany. He was born in America. Okay. okay. So he's an American. Okay. But, yes. But lives in a community that they speak German, they eat German, they think German, they are German. Right. Right. He's American. And yet, I mean, if you think about like in New York City, when the Irish Mm -hmm. first came and, Mm -hmm. you know, there was the or the Italian communities or Mm -hmm. whatever. So that's what he's living in is this German community in Ohio. And he beats the love of his life and they have a child and World War Two intrudes on their life. And he has to decide if he's going to fight in the war and his. His wife convinces him that he doesn't want to, but eventually he feels that he must. And he believes that he's going to fight the Japanese. They're the ones that bombed Pearl Harbor. And he can get behind that enemy because they're different. Right? They look different. They sound different. They eat different. Everything about them is different. And he ends up in the European theater in Germany and comes to the realization that he's more like the enemy than he is different from them. Oh, and so we, yeah, so we explore that whole concept of like, what is war and what is an enemy and how does one create an enemy? And we look at it from his point of view, but also from his wife and then his four-year-old son that he had to leave. And then we take that four-year-old as an adult man looking back. So it's a dual timeline. So it's, it's World War II time period and then present. Yeah. With with William, who was the four year old in World War Two as an old man who's yeah. going to He's visit his seven. father's grave. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's we see him in one day as he keeps reflecting back. And I've been oh. asked, like, why did you do the dual timeline? And it's because I felt that the four year old really needed a voice. We needed mm-hmm. a voice about what it's like as a child. To mm-hmm, watch your mm-hmm. your parent go off to war, mm-hmm, but as a mm-hmm. four year old, you only have so many words, and you have wow. only have so many ways of expressing yourself. And there were things that I needed him to be able to say that he can't say as a four year old, but right. he can say it as an adult looking back, remembering yes. being a four year old. Yes, right? and so yes, that's yes. why I did the dual timeline was so that I could reflect. Wow, that is amazing because, you know, you think about every now and again, you'll look at a kind of news show, a news entertainment show, and they'll show a child, say, at school and their back is turned and everybody's in on the fact that their parent has come home. Oh, those just make me cry every time. Right. And then the child is surprised and everybody's just like, oh, wow, this what a great reunion. And that that immediately transformed me to those scenes. Those kids are not usually four. They're usually in grade school, 
but but they have a voice and they're going to always reflect back and remember i remember that time when my mom or my dad surprised me at school but they're also going to remember they're going to remember them being gone that exactly and and, you know this idea that i think everyone knows that when a soldier goes off to war that it changes his thought processes and yes, orders, yes, it changes yes. the person's thought processes. But yes. we often make this assumption that they come home, they kind of reassess, and they move on. But the, yeah, truth, and but the truth is, is that it changes them forever. Okay, and it doesn't just change them. It changes their spouse, it changes right. their family. And it doesn't just change them for that it changes them for generations because that parent, so we'll make it a father. That father was gone during maybe three formative years. Right. That child now is different than they would have been had the father been present. Right. When the father comes home, he's different than he was when he left, which means he now parents different than he would have, which changes the child more. This child becomes an adult how they parent is now reflected in how they were brought up. It's a generational right. thing. Yes, yes. And I don't I think, think that they, people consider that. Yeah. The, I don't think they do either. And, and what you just said just immediately took me to the movie, The Hurt Locker. Uh, uh, one of the end scenes was uh, the guy who had done all of that miraculous stuff uh, while he was deployed. He comes back home and he's in the grocery store. And he can barely get stuff off the shelf. It was too much. You know, being in the grocery store was too much. Right. You know? And so, yeah, that 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 brings about that visualization. Now, so the person, you, you never said this. You never said that the person um, in an enemy uh, like me, you said they were German. You never said Jewish, which is a whole lot different from a lot of the stories exactly. that you read from World War II. This person is German. Now, this person did not flee. Uh, was this person more about on the Nazi? Do we do we approach Nazism? No, so, so we look at the fact. Now, one of the things that the book explores as well is that we know that there were the Japanese internment camps. Everyone's heard of them. Uh, Japanese Americans who were put in these camps because of fear, right? right? But what you don't know, or what a lot of people don't know, is that there were German American internment camps as well. Oh, I and didn't if, know that. And if they felt that you were too German, or you had too many contacts back home, or they had any any fear that you were not see sympathizer in any yeah. way yeah. you ended up in one of those internment camps wow. that was one of the key reasons that jacob in my story chose to go to uh, become a soldier was to prove that he did not have right that kind of sympathy Nazi sympathy right. yeah yeah i'm, I'm for right. america the japanese bomb pearl harbor i'm right. american i'm gonna fight those japanese exactly wow wow exactly wow, wow. And then what he finds is is you realize when he's there in germany he's one generation away from being on the other side of the war yes if his parents hadn't moved to united states to have a better life right yes. because they felt they were going to have a better life that's why they moved there they became right. very american they wanted to be american right but if they hadn't he would have been fighting on the other side of the war. He would have. He would and, have. And he recognizes that. Oh, my gosh. You know, Terry, you've done it again. Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you have certainly done it again. This has been a totally intriguing interview. Uh, you've given listeners and viewers enough information and tease enough information that they should read both books, An Enemy Like Me and Sunflowers Beneath the Snow. I mean, very, very good. I have to congratulate you once again. And we are looking forward to that third book as well. And you know what? Don't hesitate to hit me up when that comes out. Fantastic. And just to let everybody know, we're going to have Terry's information in the podcast show notes, as well as the description box beneath the YouTube video. And don't forget, make sure you swing over to my website, book-a-holic.com in the next few days. 
her guest contribution post will be up. Terry Brown, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love talking with you. Same here, same here. All right, thank you.